Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Fenestration and Product Data Templates webinar. My name is Fabi and I work as an events and membership executive for the CPA. With legislation emerging, highlighting the importance of digital product information to build safety, the need to create consensus agreed product data templates, PDTs, is becoming more, ever more important. While the Lexicon project is still in development, there are opportunities for trade associations and manufacturers to begin their journey towards creating PDTs following the Lexicon methodology. In this webinar, the panelists will highlight one uh, such example from the door and hardware sector in the hope that this might inspire others to begin their digitalization journey. In today's webinar, I am joined by Anna Clark, Digital, Digital and Policy Manager at CPA. Um, Anna will talk about the Building Safety Act, Clause 148, 149 and 150. And she will give us an update on Lexicon. Carl Collins, Head of Digital Engineering, uh, CIBSI, will talk about Golden Thread requirements and how PDTs respond to it. Douglas Masterson, Technical Manager, um, GAI, and Kevin Underwood, Technical Director, BWF, uh, will talk about um, setting up shadow relevant authority and creating a door PDTs in practice. Following the presentation, the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to answering your questions. So please feel free to type your queries in the Q&A box. And at the end of the presentation, I will be reading, reading them out to our speakers. Before turning the floor over to Anna, I want to remind you all that this webinar will be recorded and the chat will be deactivated. However, I invite you all to type your questions in the Q&A box. We hope to post the recording of this webinar on the CPA website in the next 48 hours. Thank you, Anna. You can feel free to begin. Wonderful. Thank you, Fabi, so much. If you wouldn't mind getting up those slides for me, that's fantastic. Okay. Right, so um, welcome to everybody to this webinar. Uh, what we're really looking to do here is to set the foundation of what is happening with the Building Safety Act. We've seen a lot of new legislation come into the picture recently. So thankfully, Carl will be speaking in much more detail a bit later about uh, particularly uh, the Building Safety Act and the Golden Fred legislation. I'm gonna speak a bit more uh, just about some particular things in the Building Safety Act. Obviously, we are still waiting a lot of the details to come out of secondary legislation when it comes to construction products. Uh, but uh, we still have some things that are very clear to us and there's a lot of work that we have to do to be able to come up and respond to them. So thankfully, we've got a good example of how to do that later on being presented by Douglas and Kevin. Um, so, uh, it's going to be quite a good webinar, but we've got an awful lot to cover. So I'm going to just plow on and I'm afraid in setting the scene, I'm going to have to go very quickly through a lot of different points. So, uh, Fabi, fantastic. Um, so obviously we have the Building Safety Act. I'm hoping that everybody is aware that this is coming down the line. It is the biggest piece of legislation that we've seen in over 30 years. And as I said previously, we are seeing an enormous amount of secondary legislation coming very thick and very fast down the line. Next slide, please. Um, just a couple of things that I want to bring up. Uh, Fabi, slide, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, is that we have a new regulator for construction products coming onto the scene. So we're going to see oversight like we've not really seen it any time recently before. And with the new legislation, we're seeing criminal offences, uh, uh, which is going to be uh, associated to uh, uh, construction product regulation. So sanctions will include fines, imprisonment or both. So it's extremely important that we take this all very, very seriously. Next slide, please. Uh, so I want to speak specifically about clauses 148 and 149 within the Building Safety Act, because they have very pertinent resonance to everybody who's dealing with construction products and actually further up the line. But we're seeing a new liability applying to suppliers of construction products to be held accountable 
where the product used in works causes or contributes to a dwelling being unfit for habitation. So unusually to some previous construction product regulations where there's liability normally between those who are uh, selling the construction products and those who are purchasing the construction products, we're seeing that liability extend all the way down to those who are using the construction product. And the liability is applicable to anyone who is failing to comply with construction product requirements covering a construction product. So that's your construction product regulations and any other relevant regulations. Um, and then we have anyone marketing or supplying construction products making a misleading statement in relation to it. So we haven't seen the detail behind what that looks like, but we're pretty sure that it means that you've got to have clear and um, unambiguous information that you can support uh, information uh, with uh, appropriate testing information and that that information is made accessible, that it's holistic and with all of the other legislation that it should be digitally interoperable. And then we've got anyone who manufactures a construction product which is defective. So far, so simple. Next slide, please, Fabi. Um, the liability in 148 and 149 is pretty much split up between uh, what kind of products they are. So in 148, it's in reference to general construction products. 149 is in reference to cladding construction products. So for general construction products, that liability is for any works that are completed on or after the Building Safety Act was laid, 15 years liability. For any cons cladding construction products, the same applies for works on or after the Building Safety Act was laid, but also we do have for any works completed before the Building Safety Act was laid, uh, liability for 30 years. So I want to make sure that everybody is 100% clear of what that looks like. Slide please, Stabby. Okay, so I'm not going to speak in too much detail about the Paul Morale Annalise Day report, other than to really say that um, everybody needs to be aware of this. I really hope that you're all taking the time to read it. Uh, so CPA is putting out further support uh, to uh, how we're interpreting this report. And we are seeing that while government has yet to make a response on this report, they have been reacting quite strongly to it. We've seen that the products department in uh, DLUC has uh, expanded four or five times. They are putting an enormous amount of work into it. And I think one of the reasons we've not seen statutory legislation being put out to date is because they are taking this report extremely seriously. The principles within this report are really to make sure that every player within this picture uh, is doing precisely what they ought to be doing. It really has a look at the whole structure of testing and then how people are using it. Uh, principally, all the recommendations are, uh, are aimed at making sure that these players do what they're going to uh, say they're going to do. So for that, for manufacturers, that's to make sure that we are developing products that do the job that is expected of them and to market them honestly, making no false claims. Uh, next slide, please, Fabi. And as you can see within these slides, I've actually put uh, the principles of the other different players and what we should be expecting them to do. Now, I haven't gone into much detail, as I say, because we've got an enormous amount to cover, but uh, please do pay attention to uh, this report, whether you're in manufacturing or you're other part of the built environment, Importantly, he does, uh, and Lise and, and Paul Morale do specifically mention the Mexican project within that. So we have already got support from this report to um, government and the new national regulator within the report. Next slide, please, Fabi. Hopefully most of you know about the Code for Construction Product Information. I'm not going to go into describing what the CCPI does. I've put in a link so that you can uh, explore it yourself. The reason why I bring this up is I just want to be very clear that the CCPI and the lexicon, while potentially can intertwine in the future, currently they're doing slightly different jobs. The Code for Construction Product Information is, by ma is about making sure that the behaviours behind the practice of creating construction 
construction product information are appropriate. That's if you say that there's going to be a type of performance, you can back that up appropriately and you've got all the supporting uh, processes behind uh, uh, in your company to be able to demonstrate that you're doing that appropriately. Whereas lexicon is really much more about looking at a, a consensus approach to standardizing product information and bringing all the uh, right people and processes together to do that. So we can see a future. Uh, in fact, I'm sure it's very much the intention that the code for construction product information will one day when the industry has caught up require people to provide um, a uh, uh, digital information about their construction products, uh, which has come from templates that have been agreed through industry uh, consensus approved processes. But that's not what the task of CCPI is not to develop those standards. Slide, please, Fabi. So where is lexicon, lexicon at the moment? So I'm hoping that most people will be aware, but if you're not, we have two very important uh, documents that have been published that really provide much of the detail behind how lexicon will work. Slide please, Fabi. So we've got one uh, which is the final document uh, on uh, lexicon methodology, creating relevant authorities and achieving consensus. So this is looking at the broad principles of how lexicon will function. Uh, it was arrived at, uh, it's uh, arrived at through a working group that developed these principles uh, uh, with some very, very important stakeholders in this group, uh, one of which is Sipsi, who will be speaking later, and of course, Douglas from GAI, who has been working very hard on it as well. And this particular report went through a, um, a, uh, uh, public consultation so that we made sure that everything that we developed in there really re reflect uh, the needs of industry. So that's very important. Slide please, Bavi. And the next report is what we call the phase two summary report. And what that was doing was interrogating the details of how you put those principles and actually apply those in practice. So what we've got in there is the registration processes. So if you're thinking of putting together a relevant authority, this would have very clearly what you would need to be able to evidence to be able to be considered a relevant authority. And then you've also got the processes between PDT creation, uh, publish and management processes, as well as some development of the MVP platform and what we need to do uh, in phase three to, uh, to do the further development before we can go forward with the lexicon project side, please, Fabi. So the next things that we need to do in phase three, uh, we've got to look at developing the governance processes, uh, make sure that the security um, processes are appropriate, that we've got uh, how we're going to maintain the lexicon project, what does data management look like, slide please Fabi. And then we also need to be looking at all the accompanying training and support, need to testing, and what's the legal and liability that we just need to make sure that we've got that pinned down so those who are contributing can feel absolutely safe uh, that what they're putting in isn't going to be uh, uh, messed with, essentially. Slide, please, Fabi. So where we are right now is the hub is currently entering into a new phase. It's still in the process of restructuring and securing further funding. So just to be very clear, the Lexington project is on pause, but it has not been dropped. It's still very much part of CPA's program of how we bring these things forward. Uh, but what we have been doing is very much having conversations, particularly with government and a new regulator. We've been getting them up to speed on lexicon. They are very engaged with us and they completely understand the need for the lexicon uh, report. So in the meantime, we do have those other reports. They are very clear about the principles. And what we would like to do is encourage uh, particularly trade associations, but anybody who wants to get involved, to look into developing those relevant authorities. There is totally work that can be done on creating product data templates. We need to respond to these regulations as quickly as possible. And, and later on, we can see examples of precisely how to do that. Slide please, Savvy. So that's all I've got to say to set the scene a little bit. And now I would love to hand over to Carl Collins, who's currently uh, is going to very kindly speak uh, from SIBSI and give us all of the info about Golden Fred and everything, everything else. All right, thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, just to let you know, I've got uh, an awful lot of content to get through, so I'm going to do this very, very quickly, but the slides will be uh, made available afterwards so you can digest them a little bit more at your leisure. Slide, please. As Hannah was saying, this is a big act, six parts of the schedules, all those clauses and amendments in three Queen's speeches. This is a big deal um, for us. It's probably one of the biggest changes to construction um, processes, it's certainly in my working lifetime. Slide, please. Um, so it, for me as a designer, representing designers and, con and constructors, uh, we also have a new regulator. So we have the building safety regulator. Uh, it defines what higher risk buildings are, give residents a stronger voice, which I think is really, really important. Uh, extends Defective Premises Act, provides clear oversight framework for construction products, which Hannah was just talking to, and drives industry culture change, which I think is actually really, really important. We've been doing this for too long. So we have the six parts of the Act. I'm sure you're familiar with all of them, chapter and verse, so I don't need to read that out. Slide, please. How does it affect us? So when I say us, I'm talking about uh, designers and constructors. So the new regulator will be responsible for safety and performance of all buildings in England. So it's really important that we understand that this is not just about higher risk buildings. It is a regulator for all buildings in England. What changes for higher risk buildings is the building control regime will change for the design, construction and operations. The definition of high risk building, at least 18 metres or seven storeys in height, and of the description specified in regulations made by the Secretary of State. And that is deliberately a little bit vague because that is intended to change over time. The new regime will have a gateway process, and as I'm sure you know, if you get to a gate and it is closed, you cannot pass through it. And that is literally what will happen um, now. If the regulator is not happy with what the information that they have received, they have the power to completely stop a project. Um, information has to be delivered to the regulator at the gateways and as uh, product manufacturers, this is where the concept of PDTs will become really important because you will have to submit data on products um, that are specified or are being procured for a project and this will be on a per project basis. So having that information to hand that is reusable and recyclable is going to save you an awful lot of time and money. As I said, the regulator can and will stop all project activity if they are not satisfied and you will have a legal duty to deliver this information um, and for designers and constructors to demonstrate compliance with the building regulations with that information. Slide please. Uh, the new building safety regulator, Hannah's talked about the construction products regulator for um, building safety. This is established within the health and safety executive. Um, it is not going to be labelled as the health and safety executive, it is the building safety regulator. Um, this, they've got large multidisciplinary teams. They are bringing um, more and more people into those teams. They have a lot more teeth than previous planning authorities. As Hannah mentioned about construction products, the uh, potential uh, criminal um, liabilities are very similar for the building safety regulators for construction products. It's fines, imprisonment or both. Buildings falling outside of the scope of the new regime will continue with the existing building control regime. And slide please. We will have new information deliverables and a lot of the information that is delivered to the building safety regulator will be coming from manufacturers. So when a designer is looking to build systems up, uh, they will be asking for specific pieces of information to demonstrate that the um, products they're looking at are suitable. Um, and Part of doing this information management is going to be um, hooking this into the UK BIM framework. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And slide, please. The legal requirements will primarily be on the appointing party, which is the client or the lead appointed party, which could be the designer or the constructor. But it will have a lot of ramifications on the appointed parties. In, that includes product manufacturers, facility managers, outsource, building managers, residents and the fire and rescue services. So uh, the the actual legal onus will sit with the client and the lead designers and constructors, but this may well trickle down to other people um, further down the supply chain. Next slide, please. 
So what information will be required? Now, for a designer or constructor, it would be the general building details. And I'm sure um, at some point people have come across the construction operations building information exchange um, methodology of, of, of bringing together digital information. It's going to be kind of like that, but you, you need to include things like walls and floors and ceilings, which are specifically excluded from COBE. Who authorised the design and construction work, the competencies, and um, I'm sure the CPAs, as the CTR and all of the other institutions looking very closely at competence, the architectural plans, the structural systems, the services related to fire prevention, service related smoke control and extraction, material specifications and product certifications. So Bringing all this information together is what is going to be creating the golden thread, as it's euphemistically known. So the golden thread is going to be something that increases over time when we start off at the early stages of a project. It's going to be quite a, a light piece of uh, information. But as we go through design and construction, commissioning and operations, this information will grow and grow and grow. And it's there to make the have sufficient information so you can understand a building and keep it safe. And it's important that it is accurate, understandable and accessible by all those who need it. And this does include non-specialists such as residents. Next slide, please. So the golden thread principles are listed out here and I think they're all pretty self-evident. Next slide, please. OK, next slide. So in design and construction, building control applications must contain sufficient information to show how the building, when it is built, will satisfy the functional requirements of building regulations, how the building work conforms to the design that was approved. Um, so you can't just build something that's kind of like the design. If you're going to change something, you need to be able to justify that change and you need to show those changes uh, to the building control for approval and record them in a change control log. And this is one of the things that is keeping constructors up at night, I, I would suggest. Next slide, please. So a building completion certificate application must be submitted and approved. And when they say must, that means the building cannot be used until this um, approval has been granted. So this will be the as-built plans and information. Um, as-built means literally what the building looks like at the point of handover, which for, uh, for some trade is kind of difficult because they might well have been off site for six months or a year already, but you need to be able to show what your work looks like at the point of handover, not how you left it. The information captured through construction, through commissioning and through the final functional inspections. Next slide, please. During construction, it's the principal contractor who was responsible for managing this. So these are the people who are going to be ultimately asking for your product information. It may well be that there is a bit of a, a daisy chain of uh, responsibility. The principal contractor might ask, uh, I don't know, let's, let's say um, the um, woodworking uh, contractor, and they will be asking their specialist subcontractors and they will be asking um, information from the suppliers that they are getting their materials and products from. But ultimately it is the principal contractor who will be receiving this information. Next slide, please. We must ensure robust record keeping. Um, this is really, really important. This has one, been one of the major failures um, that we've had in construction. Um, robust record keeping in terms of understanding what the products are and what they do. Again, this speaks very strongly to the product data template um, logic. Um, and all changes from the original building control approval must be recorded. So this is really important. If products are swapped out or replaced, you need to demonstrate that the replacement will perform in a similar way. Next slide, please. Okay, in occupation, it's the principal accountable person and the accountable person that will assess and manage the building safety. Again, this won't affect manufacturers too much, except for when supplying maybe replacement parts or re replacement products during the life cycle of the building. And you may need to provide updated data um, for those replacements. And again, PDTs should make this so much easier. Next slide, please. Uh, the safety case report is something that is uh, a legal requirement. And again, it's the, the accountable 
personal persons that is going to have to um, maintain the safety case um, as the building is operated and maintained um, and um, all of that information must be up to date and must be accessible. Next slide, please. This is where the British Standard 8644 Part 1 comes in. Um, this is a method by which you can maintain this golden thread of information. Next slide, please. This comes directly from uh, Dame Judith Hackett, Hackett's report. Um, uh, it's worth quoting what, what Dame Judith actually said. Almost unanimous concerns surrounding the ineffective operation of the current rules around the creation, maintenance and handover of building and fire safety information. Where building information is present, it is often incomplete or held in paper form and is not accessible to the people who need to see it. Next slide, please. There was also some strong concerns from the London Fire Brigade. I'll just read one or two of these. There's a few here. But um, regarding to the handover of fire and safety information, it is often not done well. There's little, if any, evidence of enforcement action taking place when it hasn't been undertaken appropriately. And this is one of the things that is going to change. Next slide, please. Uh, some more quotes here, I won't read them all out. Um, just the first one there, we are aware that in many cases, the Building Control Board does not review or see the content of Regulation 38 package of information. Regulation 38 being um, regarding the um, fire uh, critical information. Uh, it is a regulation, it's been around for a while, um, but it just doesn't happen. And this is also going to have to change. Next slide, please. The strategic objectives of creating this stand was to develop information management approach for the fire safety sector, which traditionally they didn't do too well. And we want to um, develop the capacity and enhance the competency of information management in that sector and produce best practice. So a lot of the information regarding products and their reactions to fire are going to be uh, requested um, by the use of the standard. Next slide, please. Now, the standard and the golden thread, the standard provides an information management process from which users can define their information requirements. So fairly early on in the project cycles, people will say, we need to know this about these things. And that requirement will then filter down through the design process, through the construction process and the commissioning process, and ultimately will be fed by information from manufacturers. Next slide, please. And it's about the life cycle, the whole life cycle of the building. Next slide, please. And as we can see here, we've got the ring of project stages. You can see there uh, A through F from early briefing all the way to the end of life of an asset. And also there is that ring G where um, the fire and rescue service may need to intervene. So from early construction right through to the asset end of life, what these letters represent is what we call the information exchange points. And there may be several of them during each of these phases, but this is where the information will be uh, collected, collated and handed across to the building safety regulator. Next slide, please. To help us do this, we've created this concept of FIRE. Now, FIRE is Fire Information Exchange, the digital wrapper for all of this fire data. And what we can do is we can link all of the product data sheets, the completed templates, together in one fiery um, information exchange. It's, it's basically just like hyperlinks through a zip file. So this is intended to be a non-proprietary information structure for sending, receiving, and storing the subset of fire safety information for an asset. Next slide, please. And it provides the means to manage fire safety information. As I'm sure you will be more than aware, on a construction uh, project, there will be huge amounts of data. And the idea of FIRE is to put that into a consistent and sensible um, container where everything is accessible. Next slide, please. And again, this is talking about the cultural change to fire safety practices. This is um, echoed throughout all of the Building Safety Act and all of the standards that are and legislation and secondary legislation is our industry needs this culture change. We need to um, be more sharing of our information because literally lives depend on it. Next slide, please. 
Okay, now I want to talk about the origin and use of P PDTs. Um, many, many years ago, we started this journey at SIBSI, and the idea is that it's simple information exchanges, which means less effort to create, less effort to exchange, less effort to consume. I was extremely frustrated at the amount of effort that manufacturers were being asked to go to in responding to requests for information. It was on almost a per inquiry basis. Every time the format was different, the questions were different. And the idea of PDT is that these, the majority of these questions are pre-answered. It's also there to reduce your risk because you can create the product data sheet from the template and be sure that this accurately reflects all of these products that are sitting in the warehouse uh, ready to be distributed, it, it's always going to be the same until it gets to site. So there won't be any contradictory or potentially erroneous information. To simplify the usage, record of, record of the information exchange and automate processes using product information. And I think this is going to be one of the big changes our industry faces going forward is the much greater automation of these processes. Next slide, please. Now, this is the first ever sort of proto PDT that I ever created. I used to be um, in charge of all of the modeling uh, content for, um, let's call them a large uh, consultant in based in London with offices globally. And when I was in charge of all of the um, families that, that we were using in our designs, I thought it'd be useful to have a sort of recipe for how we create the geometry and how the thing was going to behave. Next slide, please. But what we found was the most important was actually all of the properties that sat within these objects. And we thought, hang on a minute, there's something we're missing out on here. There's no standardized method of getting product properties from a manufacturer into what we're modeling into our systems. Next slide, please. So we looked around to see if there was anything available and um, part of the building smart work was to create a uh, sort of an IFC image, industry foundation classes image of what uh, things looked like. But as an engineer, we found that while it was useful, it wasn't complete. It didn't give us enough properties or enough options within those properties to actually um, create the lists of data that we required for our designs. Next slide, please. So we took the concepts and expanded it a little bit and we sat down with as many professionals, as many experts as we possibly could to say, OK, what is it that we need to know about this type of thing? And this is how the product data template concept came about. Next slide, please. One of the other things that we found really important as well is having information in a predictable form means that it's much easier to port it into whatever our favorite modeling application is. Here I've illustrated Revit, uh, which is a modeling platform. My lawyers reliably inform me many others are available and equally competent. Next slide, please. Now, this task was given to what was the SIBSI BIM steering group. Now, that, this started back in 2011. It doesn't seem like it was 12, 13 years ago, but it was. Wow. Um, and one of our missions was the standardization of data. The, the BIM group has now metamorphosed into the Society of Digital Engineering. And talking about competence, we are now offering uh, charter marks to digital engineers where none um, existed before. And the product data templates group is still going strong. We are still producing more and more building services related templates. Uh, we are now also looking at spaces and rooms as well as products. So you, you, are, you can understand better how the products are reacting to the requirements of the space that they're designed into. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some standards around PDTs. There's 23386, which is data dictionaries. And a data dictionary is a sort of a lake of properties that can be brought together that are used to describe various product types. There's 23387, which is data templates for construction objects using the life cycle of built assets. So this is more particularly about how you construct a data template. And PAS 14191, which was wonderfully sponsored by the Construction Products Association, is how you manage and operate interconnected construction data dictionaries. And this is one of the sort of foundational standards for what we're doing on Lexicon. Next slide, please. 
simply created some years ago our own little data dictionary called BIMHawk. Um, this is uh, this exists and may need to um, service uh, building services types of products. Um, next slide, please. And we have a store of PDTs there already. I think we have a 60 or 70, something like that, uh, available on the BIMHawk platform. Next slide. Um, these all look and quack an awful lot like an Excel spreadsheet, which is done deliberately because people are comfortable with, with the, the look and feel of, of a spreadsheet. But it is actually in uh, a digital format. It's an XML format. So a lot of this data can be operated on programmatically. You can export it as a pure XML file and consume it via whatever programmatic method you choose. Next slide, please. You can use it as a product finder if you want. Um, we do uh, also host product data sheets on there if people want to submit them. But one of the things we found um, is that manufacturers generally want to keep control over their product data sheets rather than outsource it to a, a third party. And that is entirely a decision for you. But we do offer this service um, if you um, wish to use it or not. It's up to you. Next slide, please. It also has a QA process. And again, a lot of the um, processes that Hannah was describing earlier are kind of been trialed in the BIMHawk platform. So um, if you have uh, administrator or authoring rights, you get to see this different view where we go through stages of approval um, to make sure that the product data template is fit for purpose. Next slide, please. We also allow public commenting. So when we've gone through uh, a bunch of the approvals and we're happy with what we've got so far, we will then invite people to come and comment on it. So um, you as a manufacturer will be able to comment on templates that affect your um, area of operations. Next slide, please. And also we um, provide a service where you can import these properties uh, directly into your um, families. One of the things that's really, really important is keeping those properties aligned. It's got nothing to do with the words that describe them. You can see a list there under the parameter column, things like diffuser finish, diffuser material. Those words mean nothing to the computer. It's the globally unique indicator underneath or identifier underneath that is a, a long string of hexadecimal code. That's what tells the computer this property is the same as any other property used from different manufacturers. And that is really, really important important thing to understand. Next slide, please. As Hannah was mentioning earlier about Lexicon, I won't dwell on this because Hannah's covered it beautifully already. Um, City are working with um, uh, the CPA on Lexicon. Uh, BIMHawk platform, we have actually created in a way that will be programmatically interoperable with Lexicon according to the PAS 14191 uh, strictures. So anything we do in BIMHawk when Lexicon is up and running, it will be um, a simple job to import this uh, directly in. Uh, next slide, please. And just a quick example, I've, I've been working with some colleagues at Tata Steel, and I'd just like to share one of the product data sheets that we're working on at the moment, or product data templates. And we're, we're kind of stress testing this uh, against uh, a lot of the work that the British um, Metal and Tube, British BMTFA, whatever that stands for, they do pipes. Um, they've been working on data and we've aligned their data requirements with product data templates. So um, anyone not involved in that trade association can use this and can be interoperable with the data they're looking for. And we've done this through not just creating the properties we think will be suitable, but also completing that for specific products that uh, Tata have um, helpfully um, given us. So if we can have a look at the next slide, please. And here there's a whole bunch of data, and this is all the stuff that um, you need to know and understand when selecting a pipe, when you're, whether you're a designer or a constructor, or if you're, you know, a, a maintenance worker and you need to replace something, this is telling you all of the data about the thing that was installed. So you'll understand what needs to be um, talked about if you need to replace it. Next slide, please. And also the sustainability criteria and facility management as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. That's all from me. I will now pass you over to Douglas. Yes, thank you very much, Carl. Um, so this this section will be, as it says, establishing a shadow relevant authority, which in this case is the fenestration relevant authority. So I'll I'll do a few slides on that. 
and then I will hand over to Kevin Underwood, uh, who will talk about that process. So uh, that's just a bit of background about us uh, in terms of myself and Kevin and the sort of experience that we have. But I'll, I, I won't bore you to death with all of that. We'll go on the next slide. OK, so what are we going to look at? We're going to look at heard the name BIM. Many of you will know what BIM is. So backtrack and give a quick definition of it. Uh, what we mean by a relevant authority. And and then I'm going to talk about some of these in, you know the ingredients of them because them's a bit like a like a cake. That's it. So we'll take a look at the recipe. So um we'll take a look at what a dictionary is, a little bit on PDTs because Carl has covered that in some detail, and also product data sheets. So that's taking a look at that output. Then across to Kevin for process, processes, content, how we put the the, the door set um, together, and uh, and then the next steps. So next slide, please. Okay, so what do we mean by BIM? Okay, so BIM is literally the process of creating, managing the information digitally across a construction project's life cycle. That word digital is really important because we've talked about the importance of digital information through the golden thread. It is the digital description of absolutely every as aspect of the build concept. And with every aspect detailed through mm -hmm. the development and the design and the construction phases, it allows this collaborative information sharing platform, which is constantly updated. BIM is there to create value from the combined efforts, people, process, and technology. BIM, building, information, modeling. Um, yeah, so BIM is there to create value from the combined efforts of people, process, and technology. Very often, people at the very start of BIM thought more towards the modeling and less towards the information. But our view is that when we're looking at BIM, the most important part of the BIM building information modeling is the information itself. Next slide, please. Now, Hannah has spoken about this in detail in terms of the, uh, the lexicon report, but just to give an indication of where we mean and what we, we're talking about as relevant authorities. In this report, it says that relevant authorities will be set up as part of lexicon to approve proposed unique parameters, information sets, and product data templates. In other words, these are the group, the body that's coming together as part of this lexicon process to actually put the things together, to create them. How is that methodology founded? Well, anybody who's involved in BSI standardization will be aware of the consensus process. So that consensus process means that the PDTs, the product data templates, are industry approved. That means that they create trust in how they are arrived at and structured. Carl talked about that earlier, about how that form of public comment is there. In the same way that public comment is there for British standards, it's also there for the creation of the PDTs. Uh, there is further information in the reports that Hannah mentioned as well before, the methodology and the phase two report. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by the, this relevant authority or who are the fenestration relevant authority? Well, the fenestration relevant authority was set up as really because we had a number of, uh, of organizations who had a realization that the fenestration industry needed to get together because the fenestration industry is really an industry of uh, associated parts, whether it be glass, whether it be doors, whether it be hardware, whether it be curtain walling, they're all closely interwoven. Therefore, it was decided that we would get ourselves together and start to create some product data templates. Some of them are manufacturers, some of them are trade associations, some are other businesses as well. But we came together with that purpose. Now, with the advent of the Lexicon project in early 2019, our timing was good because this group, the Fenestration Relevant Authority, we agreed to align ourselves with the principles of Lexicon. So we put ourselves forward to the Construction Products Association to become the, the actual relevant authority for these products. Now, we're set up in shadow, so we're the shadow Fenestration Relevant Authority. And that's really because there's no formal relevant authority exists as yet, but we did not want to wait for that process. So we went ahead and uh, and got going on that. 
Next slide, please. So who are the members of the Fenestration Relevant Authority? You will be glad to hear, I will not go through the alphabet spaghetti that is on the screen now, but the likes of the Guild of Architectural Ironmongers, ourselves, British Woodworking Federation, Automatic Doors, Glass and Glazing Federation, and many others, including CPA and BSI. So we all came together. And what have we done now? Well, there are a number of product data templates that have already created from these members. So we have over 30 door hardware templates created through the guild. We have powered pedestrian door uh, PDTs, which were created through the Automatic Door Suppliers Association. And we have door sets as well, which Kevin will go into in more detail shortly. Next slide, please. So I talked about the ingredients of BIM. It's a bit like a cake, I said. So you can have output and you can have input. We're not going to concentrate on the output because you can have 3D models, you can have data output. But really the input of BIM includes the likes of the softwares, online, online product library, key, critically, data dictionaries, product templates, and also product data sheets. So we've heard about PDTs, we've heard about PDSs, Next slide, please. We'll take a look at what a data dictionary is. What is it? It's a library which allows users to identify objects in the built environment and their specific properties. So it is really a semantic mapping tool and it connects like terms based upon their meaning. So for example, it doesn't matter whether we call a door a door or a door set or door assembly. The tool understands that these words are both connected to the same core concept. Next slide, please. I talked about that earlier, the good, which sounds horrible and slimy, but a good is a global unique identifier. This is what's crucial to the data dictionary. I hate this word. It's algorithmically, I got that, algorithmically generated, and it serves as a unique language dependent serial number which is assigned to each term or definition. So you really need that good, as Carl has mentioned. And the data dictionary is then used to implement this unified methodology. From that, you can produce these PDTs. So you start with the data dictionary and you go on to the PDTs. Next slide, please. Where does lexicon fit, on, fit in with the data dictionary? I know it's already been talked about. So it's the CPA and the Construction Innovation Hub initiative to create these on the dictionaries so the product data can be consistently shared for construction products in the UK. The dictionary adopted then as part of the UK National BIM family of standards and the PAS 14191 standard, which as has been previously mentioned, that covers the development, the approval, the management of the structured information within the construction data dictionaries, such as the templates, not ontologies, not taxonomies, but it complements that BSE and ISO 23386. Next slide, please. We we'll talked about this in more detail. So that's an example there, although Carl has showed one in more detail. So it's all about structured data. Somebody was to ask me, what's the point of PDT? Providing product data in a structured format. That's your common framework. You can then use that to manage, to manage construction product related data but it's in a machine readable format. So there are things which can be defined within the properties, fire rating, color, and it's really there to describe any type of product in a way that's traced to a credible source, such as a product standard, that can declare the performance char characteristics of products and the methods they should be tested against. Next slide, please. Just keep running through those ones, please. So we've got category, next one. Yep, keep going. I'll not go into those in massive detail. Carl has already covered them. Product data sheets. So data dictionary, data template, data sheet. You use the product data template if you're a manufacturer to create your product data sheet. You input that information on it. That summarizes the performance and the characteristics of the product or the material or the component. And again, it's according to the regulatory market or the requirements that have been incorporated into the mechanism of the PDT. They can then be hosted on the manufacturer's website. That gives them the structured data. Next slide, please. That's me. 
Very, very short and sweet, literally. I'm going to hand over now to Kevin to talk a little bit more about the process and the content of how the Dorset PDT was created. Thank you, Douglas. Okay, we continue. So the, the process to develop the Dorset PDT, we followed the lexicon process, and you can see a summary of it there, but we're going to go through each of the stages in more detail. So next slide, please. So the first section, the topic, we needed to identify the topic. Um, the original proposal was to look at a PDT for Windows. However, the BWF, my organization, we had a starting point for a PDT that had already been developed for fire doors. And the relevant authority agreed to initially establish a working group to complete the work on a fire doors PDT. Next slide, please. Here, the Federation Relevant Authority acted to counter to the Lexicon process. The Lexicon board should have assigned the project to the relevant authority rather than the relevant authority identifying its own project. However, as the Lexicon board was not in existence, the shadow relevant authority pressed on with the creation of the Dorset PDT. Next slide, please. Dorset Working Group was kept small with its members being taken from the relevant authority as well as other interested parties. These contributed to the development of the PDT and these included organisations that provide specialist knowledge in the structure of the PDTs and those with specialist knowledge in the door sets and their characteristics. These included test houses and fire door manufacturers. The wider group was also essential when it came to the review stage, acting as a fresh pair of eyes and uh, commenting on the PDT produced by the working group. Next slide, please. So we identified the interesting parties. Uh, organizations outside the relevant authority were contacted to contribute to the development of the product data template. These included organizations that could provide specialist knowledge. I think we've covered a lot of this. Uh, these include test houses uh, and there was the wider group. Um, next slide, please. So we started to create the PDT. In early stages of the project, it became apparent that a door set could be defined by its characteristics. For example, a fire door had the defining characteristic of the fire resistance, but also had other characteristics in common with non-fire door sets, for example, enhanced security or thermal transmittance or U-values. The project was therefore changed, moved away from a PDT for fire doors alone, and became a project to develop a door set PDT. The object was to produce a PDT that was agnostic with the respect to the materials or function. You see there, we realized, um, yeah, fire doors or the, the types of doors were defined by their characteristics. So it wasn't really relevant to continue with a single specific uh, characteristic related PDT. Next slide, please. So once an initial draft of the door set PDT had been prepared by the working group, it was circulated amongst the members of the relevant authority and other interested parties via the Construction Product Association so that they could review the draft and submit comments back to the working group. They then followed a comments resolution process where the working group considered the comments that had been submitted and made alterations to the draft product data template accordingly. Next slide, please. The, and publishing. The product data template is, is in Excel format and is being hosted online. Uh, each member of the Fenestration Relevant Authority will have a link to the product data template on their website where it will be publicly available. And there you can see where it's hosted on the Guild of Architectural Ironmongers website. And I assume the QR code will take you to that. Next slide, please. And the review process. With the wider use of the product data template, there are bound to be further comments and suggestions for its enhancement. Any user of the product data template can submit comments to the original working group or if the working group has disbanded to the relevant authority. Regardless of any comments that are submitted under the lexicon process, any PDT will be reviewed on a regular basis by the relevant authority, reflecting changes in legislation or standards. You know, as, as with BSI standards, the PDT has to be flexible and developed uh, reflect changes in the industry. Next slide, please. So product, uh, product data template 
content. Dorset product data template contains characteristics that are derived from the following data sources. So from legislation, for example, the building regulation guidance, from standards, for example, the harmonized or designated standards and national standards, industry standards, for example, those from Secure by Design or from the NHBC, and project specific requirements. So we did a trawl of all the relevant documents and put into the PDT the characteristics, the uh, information requirements that were called up by the, all those sources. Next slide, please. Product data template content. The Dorset product data template contains data in the following categories. Manufacturer's data, construction data, construction data on components, dimensional data, performance data, electrical data, sustainability and operation and maintenance. Um, it, it was hard. I think we, in the review phase, we did uh, a bit of pulling characteristics and information from one category into another until it all made sense. It, it needed those uh, fresh eyes from the commenters to see where the information was being placed in the wrong place. But there was uh, definitely some tidying up that was needed to be done. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a snapshot of what the product data template looks like. It's just in different colors to the ones that Carl showed from Sibti, but it contains the same form of information. Next slide, please. Um, Penetration relevant authority, the next step. So we're going to continue with the ongoing review of the existing PDTs. And we're currently working on the creation of a product data template for window hardware that's due to be published soon. And then the next product data template topics will be for windows and roof lights. We have one question here. Will the building safety regulation, regulator require product data to be supplied via a lexicon PDT? If so, how can this be done now, next six months, without lexicon in place? And if not, where is the driver to get uh, PDTs adopted? To Carl. I've got some thoughts on this, but I might hand over to Carl first and see if anybody else has got some thoughts on this. But uh, yeah, I have some thoughts to come in after. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I don't think there's going to be a legal requirement to use PDTs. Um, there's um, strong resistance for forcing anyone down any singular path. Um, though I think from experience, using the PDT concept and PDS mechanism, is going to be a path of least resistance. And that's kind of why we created PDTs in the first place, is to prevent manufacturers getting bombarded with custom style information requests. So if you have a product data sheet for a product, you can um, use it many, many times over and you don't have to completely do um, um, redo all of the information requirements. In the net term of the next six months or so, if you have a PDT in your for your product range, then that's great. I would recommend using that. We do also have what we call our templates of templates, which is the, the very, very basic information that identifies who you are and what the product is. It's not going to be sufficient on its own to satisfy the information requirements of the golden thread, but it will certainly reduce the information load by a decent percentage. Thanks, Carl. I'm just going to come in with my own thoughts and then I'm going to see if uh, Douglas or Kevin have wants to interject. Um, what we've got a, an issue with here is, is uh, risk, I think. I think there's an enormous amount of risk that uh, while we have all of these different manufacturers uh, presenting information in different ways, and we've got all of these people who are on projects requesting information in different ways, we're gonna have just too many different uh, things to answer. And and the, the, the when I'm describing the need behind lexicon to government, to the OPSS and why they particularly get this, it's, I mean, the technology is there, actually that's not the issue. 
what we have the issue is is that we haven't got standardized methods of presented presenting uh, that information and in similarly to how we have standards for um for example for testing and for how you put together products we need standardized methods of uh, representing that information and in and and as the other side of that until we standardize those methods we can't clearly pass that information up in a consistent way so um while we're yet to see the detail of what precisely these regulations are going to actually ask for you can bet your bottom dollar that if we don't standardize these approaches we're going to be chasing our tails um so this is really about how do we put into work right now so that down the line we don't have regulators turning around and going well you presented the information that way how but that not what we want so that doesn't give us a holistic picture but also we're not going to be able to consistently pass that information up the supply chain because we won't be able to digitalize it in a way that everybody can agree that that's the only approach to do it and then you won't also see that feedback loop and that feedback loop is absolutely essential to make sure that we're going in the right direction uh douglas kevin do you have any thoughts yeah i'll just in terms of the, the question what's the driver to get PDTs adopted. The driver's not there to get PDTs adopted. The driver is there under the golden thread to have standardized product data. What a PDT does, it provides the methodology. Having your product data in a standardized format, and there may be other ways of doing that, but if we have a peer review method under lexicon process or using lexicon type processes, which is what we've done as Kevin had outlined, that means that there is a means and method of being able to have that data in a standardized format. That means if you have it in a standardized format, it means it gives better compliance with the golden thread. Thanks, Douglas. Anyone wants to add anything else? Yes, um, just the the, Secretary legislation that came out a few weeks ago, so the, the Building Higher Risk Building Procedures England Regulations 2023 has, has established in legislation the requirement for the golden thread information to be exchanged digitally and maintained digitally. And it also sets the responsibilities of the client to maintain their electronic facility for, for storing the information. So now that we've got in legislation that the information has to be kept in digital format, it makes it clear that the, the, there'll be commonality in the way that the product information is exchanged to be put into that vault of uh, digital information. And the PDT seems to be a, a, a good form of product data sheets as an excellent form of transferring that information. It will be um, presented in a format that manufacturers can complete to produce their product data sheet. And it would be common for all manufacturers in a sector who would, could be using the same product data template to create their product data sheet. So it allows um, easier transfer of information and it informs both the client and the manufacturer on what information is needed to be exchanged. And as, a, as we mentioned earlier, the product data templates will be reviewed regularly so that they keep up to date with the, the demands of the industry. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to add, although the lexicon um, uh, uh, data dictionary is unavailable, and we appreciate that. One of the purposes of this particular webinar is to say, yes, we're, that's still under development. However, we have the processes available for everyone and we have sources of how you can do this. So what we're trying to encourage people is to go, okay, we do this now. When lexicon comes into, space, into place, it is, we are going to be looking at the people who are already doing the work on the data, PDTs first and foremost to encourage them into the system. It's very meant, to, it's meant to be inclusive. Uh, so, you know, what we would recommend is you follow the lexicon processes, and then when the lexicon data dictionary comes in for us to be able to store it all in one place, you can hit the ground running. So. Thanks, Anna. Um, will the loop be closed between PDTs and smart CE or UKCA marking? 
uh, where HEN or this designated standard exists, what needs to happen to streamline the information manufacturers uh, need to provide for different purposes, UKCA marking, BSA, Golden Thread, BIM, CCPI? Who wants to throw in on this one? Go on then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, I, I talk to a lot of manufacturers um, just as part of my day job, and this is probably one of the most asked questions there is. Um, in fact, the the, um, the the list read out there is probably a fraction of what manufacturers actually experience in, in their working lives because there's all sorts of other uh, requests for information from various um, bodies and customers and clients and what have you. Certainly when we're creating templates as um, Douglas and Kevin showed is you have to do your domain research. So if you do have a harmonized European norm, which has got um, a whole bunch of data requirements in the back of that, then that's gonna be an absolute golden source of properties that should be going into your template. Um, when we first started doing PDTs all those years ago, it was there to provide a single source of truth that answered all of those questions and not to be just another information requirement that uh, you need to fulfill. So it's, you know, the, um, the, when we looked at the fenestration PDT, there's a lot of properties there and that's kind of by design. You know, it's there not to answer one person's question, it's there to answer as many questions as it possibly can. Because once you've answered it, once you've done it until the product changes, and when the product changes, you update whatever properties need to be changed and it's done again. And then you can start to answer all of those questions that were listed out. And that was a pretty good thorough list, so well done whoever wrote that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's, we're not trying to align with anything. We're just trying to consume all these other information requirements and make it a one-stop shop. Thank you, Carl. Um, the same person is asking who will police the PDTs? What prevents empty declaration in PDTs? I just wanted to come back, Fabi, on that uh, sure. previous question, which is the the product data template that we've produced for door sets includes a position to link through to the declaration of performance. So, um, and the, when we state the performances of characteristics that would be essential characteristics for conformity marking, you have to state that, that value um, on the DOP before it can be used in any other format. In any other way so if you if you declare the performance of an essential characteristic you have to do it first on the dop and then you can declare it elsewhere but we will be calling up the dop and of course with the code construction product information the product data sheet will be ideal because that, that will be presenting at least it's, it's a method of presenting the information um the it will still be up to the manufacturer to present the correct information on the product data sheet and and um, we've seen that the product data sheets can be used for exchanging information to meet the requirements of any of the uh, secondary, legislation, secondary legislation following the Building Safety Act. So sorry to jump in there, anyway, I've forgotten what the other question was now. It was about the presentation of uh, PDSs. So who will police the product data sheets? What prevents NC declarations on product data sheets? Um, so there's not going to be a policing system from the lexicon project once the product data template is handed over then it becomes a manufacturer's information once they populate that now then the same systems that in the presentation of any other of that manufacturer information will come into play so then you've got the scenario where you've got the regulators that will be looking at that if you're signed up to the code for construction product information then they will be saying if you're putting in a performance requirements you must be able to back that up there aren't uh there 
if with a product data sheet, there is only actually very limited information within a product data sheet that should be considered mandatory. They are often put together in a way that should be made applicable to as many different uh, products as possible. So the uh, different uh, properties within there uh, may not all be relevant to all products. So you, it's a kind of a glorified checklist. But what comes with that checklist is that once you populate it, then you've got that digital information associated with it. And that's very, very critical. Uh, but it is down to the manufacturers to be able to fill those in appropriately, to be um, making sure that they're putting in the holistic information and it will still, that information will be there. So then when somebody is querying down the line, why haven't you populated this particular performance? Uh, then you've got to ask yourself some questions, uh, but it won't be policed on how you fill them in. What we're giving is a structure for everybody to fill it all in the same and using the diff same kind of descriptors for how performance is identified. Um, anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah, just a, an, an agreement with that. It, it really is. The, the thing you need to bear in mind about a template is it is exactly that. It is a template. Um, it provides that structured methodology for people to be able to fill in their information to create the product data sheet. So if there are things that you don't need within it, then that's fine. Just don't use them. You know, the, 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 the data sheet that we provided for door sets has a wealth of information. Some of it's in relation to security doors. So if your fire, or if your door is a purely a fire door and it's not security, that's fine. Either put no performance declared or take it out. It's there as a template. It's there as a methodology to create your product data sheet. So as Hannah said, it's it's not for any of us to go and start uh, asking how people are, are are using the PDTs to create their product data sheet. There's already product data out there in the marketplace. People have to have it. Uh, because people need it. Really what this is, is providing that structure. And if people are starting to, to fill it in incorrectly, well then that there's, as has been mentioned, there's 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 regulators that are out there, whether they be the BSR or the, the National Construction Product Regulator, who uh, creating standards who can, uh, who can start to fill in on that. But it's all about that sort of structured data there to be able to, to, to do it in, in the one method. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add anything? I think uh, Douglas covered what I was going to say is that if you don't have a, a characteristic, if, if you're not providing a door set that is enhanced security, then you don't fill in the information around enhanced security. So we've we've put uh, in the template what we perceived in the development process as the possible characteristics of the product that could be uh, stated, but they don't apply to all products. As we said, we started off with the view that we would develop a fire door template, but then realized if you made a door set template and you had a field for the fire characteristics, if those were left blank, it would then just be a door set. If they're filled in, then it's a fire door set. So it works in both ways. If you fill in the uh, acoustic performance, then you've got that information, if you've got the enhanced security, you put that in, the thermal transmittance values, this all builds up the uh, the view of the product, but you don't have to complete every characteristic because they may not apply to your particular product. Thank you, Gavin. I think we have time for one last question. Um, will Lexicon be interoperable with BSI Identify? Yes. Um, <laughs> BSI Identify really just um, gives manufacturers the option to point to information. So uh, anybody who is uh, wanting to point to a pre product data sheet, you can do that within PS, BSI Identify. They're totally, totally uh, available for one working with the other. And uh, BSI has been an enormous stakeholder and a contributor to the development of Lexicon thus far. So, yeah, they did. Thank you, Anna. Anyone wants to add anything before we close the webinar? I just, um, in, in the product data sheet, you, we do ask for, um, say, maintenance information would be linked to documents, possibly a PDF, giving that maintenance information. Um, and the digital object identifiers, like BSI Identify, 
will maintain a position for that link to go to, even if the manufacturer changes where the source of their information is. So it would it does have value in maintaining that information. Thanks, Kevin. Um, once again, thank you everyone for joining this webinar today. Uh, we hope you find you found it interesting. If you have any further questions or comments, you can email me and I will reach out to our speakers. Um, finally, I uh, just want to remind you all that the webinar will be available over the next 48 hours on the CPA website and on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you and have a nice rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.